My name is Richard Lavoie, and I'm the director of the Eagle Hill School Outreach Program based in Greenwich, Connecticut. In a few moments, we're going to fill this room with an audience of people who will have the opportunity to experience what it's like to actually be a learning disabled child. Six to ten percent of the children in the United States today suffer from learning disabilities. This translates to hundreds and thousands of children and hundreds of thousands of families that are affected by this disability. In order to understand learning disabilities and what the child goes through, we of course must first understand what the term means. And when we talk about learning disabled children, we don't talk about what the child is, but we talk rather about what he is not. It's a definition of exclusion. In other words, give me five children that aren't functioning in the classroom. Take away the child who's mentally impaired, mentally retarded in some way. Take away the child who has a primary emotional disturbance. Take away the child who's not had the opportunity to learn and take away the child who has some modality deficit, who perhaps is deaf or blind. The child that remains is a learning disabled child. That is, the child is not functioning in school, and yet his modalities are intact, he's had the opportunity to learn, he's not disturbed, and he's not retarded. One of the most common misconceptions about learning disabilities is that it's a school problem, when in actuality it affects every waking moment of the child's day. For that reason, we've called together a group of people today that view the child through very, very different eyes. We have a social worker, a psychologist, a recreational therapist, a regular education teacher, special education teachers, and most importantly, parents, teachers, and friends of learning disabled children. And those people will have the opportunity to walk for a mile in the shoes of the learning disabled child and see firsthand the frustration, anxiety, and tension that those children experience in school every day. The rules are very simple. First of all, this is not a role-playing activity. It's what's called simulation. Now, if you don't want to participate in this, if you would prefer to sit this out and you don't want to be called on, if you don't like being embarrassed in front of people and being asked to do things you can't do and being made to feel really uncomfortable, okay? That's tough. Because one of the things that you've got to gain as a parent or a teacher dealing with learning disabled people is this, the idea of problem ownership. You see, the learning disabled child isn't learning disabled just so he can mess up your English class eighth period every day. He's not learning disabled just to complicate your lifestyle at home. He has no choice. So, we want everyone to participate. The first rule, the second rule is please no role playing. We don't want you to try to act like kids. The material will make it difficult for you to function. There is no need for you to try to make it worse than it really is, okay? <laughs> and I am going to have the bias that many mainstream teachers have, which is that LD means lazy and dumb. And if you just push the kids and motivate them enough, they can learn. It's that they choose not to. Um, again, please just follow along with me. Don't take anything personally. We'll have a good time doing this thing. Nobody's going to get hurt, but uh, you will get a chance to see what it's like to be a learning disabled child. What color is the booklet, Carol? Blue. What's it say in the front of the booklet, uh, Kit? Affectity. What's it stand for, Carolyn? What does it stand for, Carolyn? I don't know. What is it? It says at the bottom of the book. What's it stand for, Maria? Frustration, anxiety, and tension. Frustration, anxiety, and tension. Uh, what kind of animal is top of the page, Cara? Uh, bird. Turn to the next page. What color is the first page, Jane? Blue. Uh, what does it say in the first page, Carol? The first page, Carol. Earth to Carol, come in, please. The first page. Earth to Carol, come in, please. Raise your hand if you thought that was funny. Yeah, everybody likes that except who? Except Carol. Anytime you as a teacher or a parent decide to use sarcasm with kids, understand that you've created a victim. Now that little throwaway line that I threw at Carol, I will forget within five minutes, you will forget within five minutes, but it's very likely to stay with Carol for the rest of the day. Those little throwaway sarcasms we use. Jody, what color is the print in the first page? Black. What does it say, Lee? Activity one. What is that what it says, Stephanie? Yes. Turn to the next page. What color is the next page, Lee? Yellow. Uh, what kind of animal is top of that page, Jody? Uh, tiger. A that's not a tiger. Cal, what kind of animal is top of that page? It's a cat. It's a cat. Uh, famous story with a cat in it, Maria. Famous story with a cat in it. Famous story with a cat in it, Maria. Famous story with a cat in it. Give me one famous story with a cat in it, Maria. Okay, does anxiety affect performance? Does anxiety affect performance? Of course it does. According to this, Maria doesn't know one story with a cat in it. <laughs> give Maria a call tomorrow, she'll give you 30 of them. But in this situation, with the anxiety we've created already, with the anxiety that we've created in the short period of time, Maria's unable to get that information out. Famous story with the cat in it, Carol. Three little kittens. Famous story with the cat in it, Debbie. Garfield. Famous story with the cat in it, Carol. Incredible journey. Famous story with the cat in it, Kelly. 
Melissa? Karen? Uh, Kim? Merritt? Okay, let's take a look at what's happened now. I accepted the answer, I don't know, from Kelly. What were the next four answers that I got in a row? I don't know. See, we have to really put this under a microscope and look at this. You people have been learning disabled now for six minutes, and many of you have quit. Not six years, not 16 years, the way the LD child lives, but six minutes. And many of you, once I began accepting the answer, I don't know, how many of you decided if he calls on me, I'm going to say, I don't know. Raise your hands. <laughs> yeah. Many of you have decided if he's going to accept I don't know as an answer, I'm going to stop trying to think of a response, and I'll just say, I don't know. Okay, Jody, what kind of animal is that? Top of the page again? Cat. Down below, what kind of animal is that? Lee? Duck. Stephanie, what kind of noise did a duck make? Quack. Famous story of the duck and a Nancy. Duck. Famous story of the duck and a Karen. You were ready for me, weren't you, Nancy? <laughs> Famous story of the duck and a Karen. <laughs> Famous story with the duck in it. Come on. Famous I, story with the duck in it. One famous story with the duck in it, Karen. I can't think famous of story, story with the duck in it. Fam it doesn't um, take a lot of thought, Karen. Famous story with the duck in it. Um, one famous story with the duck in it. Ka Nancy knew one. Yeah, well, Nancy's better than I am. <laughs> I can't think of Debbie, a story famous story with the duck in it. Duck. Famous story with the duck in it. Famous story with the duck in it, Karen. Make way for duck. Famous story with the duck in it, Kelly. I was going to say Donald Duck. Oh, she took my answer. Don't you like it? Melissa, famous story with a duck in it. Turn the page. Karen, what kind of animal is that? Top of the page. I'm sorry? A pig. What kind of noise did a pig make, Kim? Famous story with a pig in it, Merritt. Famous story with a pig in it, Merritt. Famous story with a pig in it, Paula. Down below, what kind of animal is that, Car? Swan. Uh, what kind of noise did it make, Debbie? <laughs> okay, see, what you've got to see sometime is you've got to see Fat City from where I'm standing. Because I've got 15 people looking up at me, and I say, what kind of noise does a swan make? And everybody takes a sudden interest in their shoes. They look down and oh, good. they're both on there. In other words, what happens is, after, after nine minutes of a learning disability, you people have already bought into one of the, the credos that controls the life of the LD child, which is this. If I can't see the teacher, the teacher can't see me. And so what you do is you look away because we all know, we all know that it is the human reaction to anxiety. The first human reaction to anxiety is to look away from the source of the anxiety. And yet, what's the first thing we say to kids when we yell at them? You look at me while I'm yelling at you. You look at me while I'm spoiling your life. There are so many things we do as parents and teachers that don't make any sense. How many people here insist that kids look at them when we yell at them? I do all the time, and it makes absolutely no sense, and it's contrary to everything we know about the human reaction to anxiety. Okay? Turn the page, stop the page, camera, what kind of animal is that? Oh, a horse. What kind of noise did it make, Debbie? Nay. Famous story with a horse in a car? Black sign. Famous story with a horse in it, Kelly? Black beauty. Melissa, famous they story with a horse in it? They took both my answers. <laughs> Karen, famous story with a horse in it? Kim, famous story with a horse in it. Come on. Black famous story with a horse in it. Mary. Black Beauty. Kind of animals down below, bottom of the page, Kelly. A camel. Okay, just keep the books right where they are. Let's talk for a second. What about the pace of the class? <laughs> Too what? Too what? Too fast. Okay, now this is important to understand as a mainstream teacher, particularly. Learning disabled kids have a difficult time processing the language. As a result of that, if I ask a group, a mainstream classroom, fourth grade class with some learning disabled children and some non-disabled children, and I say, would you please tell me who, the who was the first president of the United States? The non-LD children are processing an answer. The learning disabled children have to process what? The question. So in effect, they have twice the processing load to do than the other students in the class. So even if the class is moving at a normal rate, to the LD child it seems to be moving at this breakneck speed as we've been talking here. So you say, who was the first president of the United States? The non-LD kids are processing an answer. The LD kids have to process the question. They actually have to go, okay, let's see who. It means it's going to be a person. Was means he's probably dead. First, the one at the beginning. President is probably the one in Washington of the United States. President of the United States. The one of, okay, who's the first president of the United States? Oh, I know that. He raises his hand. Everybody else has gone to recess because he had twice the processing load to do. Lee is my non-LD child. Stephanie is my LD child. And I say, Lee, could you please tell us the name of the book we're reading today? And she says, Huckleberry Finn. 
And I say, Stephanie, could you please tell us who wrote that book? And she says what? Huckleberry, Huckleberry Finn. How many times does that happen to you in the classroom? Why? Because what happens is Stephanie is so busy processing the first question that she misses the fact that Lee responded to it, misses the fact that I asked the second question and responds to the last question that she processed. But of course, what happens in a typical classroom? What's the name of the book we're reading, Lee? Huckleberry Finn, good. And Stephanie, who wrote it? And she says, Huckleberry Finn, the whole class laughs. And we say, Stephanie, leave the room. You've disrupted my class for the last time. Now that teacher would not punish uh, Stephanie for being unable to read or able to do math because she understands a learning disability. And yet the child will be punished for doing, having a processing difficulty and all of those problems are caused by the same thing, which is this inability to process language. So as a teacher, what do you do about that? There are some techniques you can use. Let me show you one very quickly. Stephanie's the LD child in the classroom. What I do is I take Stephanie aside sometime when no one else is around. Just Stephanie and myself, and I sit down and I say, Stephanie, you're having trouble with my lectures, aren't you? Yes, I am, Mr. Lavoie, you talk so fast. Well, as a matter of fact, Stephanie, I don't talk too fast, but it seems that way to you. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna make a little deal. Because I'm sure not only is it difficult for you to process, but you're also nervous that I'm gonna call on you. Yeah, I'm so nervous you're gonna call on me that I lose track of what you're saying and it makes it worse. Here's a deal we're gonna make, Stephanie. I will never call on you unless I'm standing in front of your seat. So while I'm over here lecturing, you take all of your energy and you put it into concentrating on the lecture and understanding and processing the lecture, and don't worry, I won't call on you. So the next day I come into class and I'm standing over here, we're talking about the War of 1812, and I'm throwing questions at Maria, and at Kit, and at Jody, and at Kara, and then I look over at Stephanie, and I kind of move over in front of her desk, and I say, and Stephanie, maybe you could tell us who the president was during the War of 1812. And she answers the question, I say, thank you, and move away. No one else knows that that went on. And of course, what I do is I ask her questions I know she can answer, and eventually, I'll be over here lecturing, and you begin to see her hand goes up, because now she understands that she can survive this experience called volunteering in school. The most common misconceptions about learning disabled children is this. He's very distractible. He has no attention span at all. Using the terms distractible and attention span interchangeably, when actually those are two completely different children. You see, the child with no attention span pays attention to nothing. The child who's distractible pays attention to everything. The learning disabled child is distractible. In other words, he can't focus anything out. So he might be sitting there listening to me talk, and he's interested in what I'm saying, but he's equally interested in my shoes, in my watch, in the fact that his shoes are too tight, in the picture of the Indian behind me. He can't focus anything out. Everything gets his attention. And the same thing happens with oral language. They can't focus that kind of thing out because of the processing deficit. Imagine going to school every day where things seem to be going as fast as we've been going now. No wonder they come up with those strange stomach aches before they go to school in the morning. Okay, bottom of the page again. Don't turn the page. Bottom of the page. What kind of animal is that, Jody? Camel. Uh, Lee, if I want to see a camel, where can I go? To a desert. Uh, well, where's a good desert, uh, Stephanie? Where's a big desert? What country? The Sahara. Quickly, another one. Sa uh, Nancy, what country? What country is the Sahara in, Nancy? Uh, Africa. Good guess. <laughs> <laughs> If I want to see a camel, where can I go? Egypt. A famous story with a camel in it, Debbie. Kai, do you know a famous story with a camel in it? The Kipling's Just So Story. Tell me, famous story with a camel in it. <laughs> the Arabian Nights. Melissa, famous story with a camel in it. I don't know. Okay, don't turn the page yet. Who wants to volunteer for the next one? <laughs> <laughs> Let's take a look. Not one volunteer. Why? There's two reasons why you won't volunteer in this particular exercise. Let me explain to you what they are. First of all, you've been learning disabled now for the last 10 minutes or so. Learning disabled people do not like surprises. They don't like dealing with something if they don't know what's coming up. You don't know what's coming up, so you're not going to volunteer. But that's not the real reason you're not volunteering. The real reason you're not volunteering is this. And think about this. What did I say to you when you got an answer right? What did I say? Nothing. Nothing. No reinforcement, no recognition, no reward. I never told anyone it was a good answer. I never responded positively to one response that I got. What did I say when you couldn't get an answer, when you couldn't think of something or you made a mistake? What did I say then? I had plenty to say then, didn't I? <laughs> you see, what you've, learned, what you've learned in 10 minutes is what the learning disabled child has learned in his school history, and that is this. 
You're sitting there thinking, why should I play with this guy? Why should I play this game? Because based on what I've seen, if I get the answer right, he's not going to say anything. And if I get it wrong, he's going to embarrass me. So why should I volunteer? You see, what I've done is knocked all of the risk-taking out of you. When we deal with learning disabled adults, we find their most common problem is they won't take chances. Because all of the risk-taking was knocked out of them in their early years. Because you've learned that if you get the answer correct, I'm not going to give you any reinforcement. You're thinking, what's the best that can happen? The best that can happen here is that I get the answer correct and he won't say anything. But the worst that can happen is I get it wrong and he's going to embarrass me. So I'm just going to sit here, I'll respond if he calls on me, but there's no way I'm going to volunteer. Okay, open the next page, go. Raise your hand if you can tell me what's on this page. Just look at your own books. Look at your own books, please. Do you know what that is, Elaine? Yes or no? Yes or no? Do you know what it is? Yes or no? Just yes or no answer. Do you know what that is, Tom? Yes or no? Yes. Do you know what that is, Carol? Yes or no? Possibly. Do you know what that is, Stephanie? Yes or no? Yes. Do you know what that is, Karen? Yes or no? Yes or no, Karen? No, no. Debbie, do you know what that is? Yes or no? No. Okay? Let's work with Debbie here, okay? Let me show you what happens with the learning disabled child in the classroom when he's unable to perceive. There's basically four things a teacher does when the child cannot perceive something. Here's the first thing that teachers do. Each one is a little bit sillier than the one in front of it. Here's the first thing that teachers do. Debbie, tell me what that is. Debbie, look at it. A rock. Debbie, look at it. Here it comes. Debbie, look at it harder. See, I don't know what that means. <laughs> I've heard teachers for years tell kids to look at something harder. I have no idea what that means. I don't know what that means. I mean, I can push harder or pull harder, but I can't look at something harder. So the first thing we do is we tell them to look at it harder. That doesn't work. We do this. Debbie, put the book. You don't have to turn the book around. <laughs> First thing we, second thing we do is we say we're going to give them something. Debbie, would you please tell me what that is? Tell me what that is and you can be first in line for recess. Did that help? No, why do we do that? Help. Why do we do that as teachers? The child can't do something, so we automatically promise him something if he can. That would be like if I took my child to the hospital with a temperature of 105 degrees and I went to the doctor and I said, doctor, my child's got a temperature of 105 degrees. And the doctor said, here, I tell you what, here, I'll give you this dollar. I'll give you this dollar if you can get it down to 102, son. How would that be? You would expect the doctor to give some sort of medicine. You wouldn't expect the doctor to try to bri bribe the child out of his temperature, and yet that's what we do with kids. We try to bribe them by giving them things. Did that help, Debbie? It's a man. No. Okay. All right. Okay. It's got a coat okay. on. All right. We do three things. We basically do... Now, the third thing we do is we begin taking things away. We begin taking things away from the child. Tell me what that is or you can't go to recess. Tell me what that is or I'll send a note home to your mother. Tell me what that is or I'll drop you down a reading group. When that doesn't work, we go into our fourth mode, which is something that I find very distressing as a personality trait that many, many teachers have, and that is we do what's called blaming the victim. What we do is we blame Debbie. We say, the reason Debbie can't tell me what this is is she's not what? Trying. Trying hard enough. You see, what that reflects is what we call blaming the victim. That reflects blaming the victim. What we say is, the reason the child can't tell me what this is is that the child is not motivated. It's a motivational problem. Because we all know that the answer to learning disabilities is motivation, right? The key to overcoming learning disabilities is motivation, correct? Wrong. Wrong. Motivation is one of the most misunderstood concepts in education today. Motivation only enables us to do, to the best of our ability, what we are already capable of doing. Let's try it a little bit more. Debbie, can you tell me what this is now? Yes or no? It's yes or no, of Debbie? Course. No, I, I okay. don't know what that thing is. Okay, here we go, Debbie. Well, I've got a check, blank check for $100. I will sign this over to you if you can tell me what this is in oh, five my seconds. going to kill me. <laughs> five, four, three, two, one. Five more seconds for $100. Five, four, three, two, one. Was Debbie motivated? Was Debbie motivated? Could she do it? No, because you see, learning disabilities has very little to do with motivation. What it really has to do with is perception. Perception. You see, you can all see this picture, but you can't perceive it. Here's what I'm going to do. I am now going to give you some direct instruction. 
Once I tell you what this is, about half of you will automatically get it, and you won't understand why you couldn't see it in the first place. The rest of you will need a little extra help, and that's okay, too. There'll also be some of you who'll say, oh yeah, I know what that is, but you really don't. Don't do that, okay? <laughs> don't do that. Try, you know, you really want to, once you see it, it's like turning on a light in a dark room. But this is a classic picture that illustrates the difference between vision and perception. You can all see it, but you can't bring meaning to it until I teach you what it is. And this activity is done to demonstrate that what the LD child needs is a teacher. He needs a teacher, not, a, not necessarily all kinds of commercial software. What he needs is a teacher to give him this direct instruction, because once I give you this direct instruction, you will be able to see this perfectly clearly. What you have in front of you is a photograph, a poor quality photograph, but the photograph of the face of a cow. The cow's looking directly in your face. Raise your hand if you cannot see it, I'll come around and show it to you. Raise your hand if you can't see it. Face of a cow. see it? Anybody not see it? Nancy? Face of a cow. Oh! <laughs> okay, all right. Over here, anybody not see it? Can you see it? Let me do Carolyn. Carolyn? It's the face of a cow. Okay, all right. Elaine? Face of a cow. Okay, anybody back here? Susan, Ann, Rita? Huh? Anybody not see it yet? Does anyone not see it? Okay, everyone, please look at your picture. What do you have in front of you? It's a cow. It always was a cow. I didn't change it. I didn't change the stimulus. All I did is give you direct instruction. And yet what we do with learning disabled kids is we expect them to go in a corner and teach themselves. Or we assign them to the nearest intern or teacher aide or volunteer grandmother that we have. What they need is trained, experienced teachers. Once I taught you what this was, you had a little difficulty perceiving it. But you see, this doesn't really capture the experience of the LD child for this reason. No one in this room could do this. The real experience of learning disabilities is being the only person who can't do it. The other kids open up their books and they get to work and the poor LD child sits there and thinks, what's everybody doing? I don't understand what this is. I can't understand this. Well, how can everybody get to work right away? See, that's the real experience of being learning disabled, is being the only one who can't do it. According to the International Reading Association, 95% of textbooks and 93% of teachers teach comprehension through vocabulary. In other words, we go through the words, we find the words, any words the child's going to have difficulty with, we teach him those words, and then we assume he'll be able to understand the story. The bias behind that, or the theory behind that, is if you understand every word in a paragraph or in a passage, you can understand the passage. Is that true? Let's take a look, okay? Let's look at that column of words, those three columns of words. Any words that you've never seen before? <coughs> Tom, any words you've never seen? No. Anne? Tom? No? Cara? Kit, any words you've never seen before? Maria? No. Can I then make the assumption that you understand every word that's listed here? Can I? Sure I can. Therefore, can I further make the assumption that if I give you a paragraph that contains these words and only these words, you'll be able to understand the paragraph. Can I make that assumption as well? 93% of teachers do. Let's give it a shot. When I say go, we're going to open to the next page, and you're going to follow along while I read a paragraph that contains those words and only those words. And then we'll have a little quiz on it afterwards. Okay? Turn the page, please, and follow along while I read. It says, if the known relation between the variables consists of a table of corresponding values, the graph consists only of the corresponding set of isolated points. If the variables are known to vary continuously, one often draws a curve to show the variation. Thanks. Stephanie, is that okay with you? <laughs> sure, I agree. Nancy, do you agree? Sure. Karen, would you like to take a quiz on that? Debbie? Kyra? No. Raise your hand. I promise I won't pick on you, but raise your hand if you do understand what this paragraph means. I promise I won't pick on you, but raise your hand if you do. Merritt, what's your academic background? Engineer. Mathematics. Okay. <laughs> you see, comprehension has much more to do with background than it does with vocabulary. Merritt is able to understand it, not necessarily because he's any brighter than any of us, but his background in his... <laughs> particularly today, right, Merritt? His background in his training has enabled him to understand this. That's what, that's what comprehension is about, not vocabulary. 
We cannot assume that because a person understands every word in the passage, he can understand the passage. Now, keeping that thought in mind, everybody in the back of your book has a little sheet of paper. Pull that sheet of paper out. And I want you to read silently while I read aloud the paragraph on the bottom of that page. The previous activity, you understood every word in the paragraph, but you couldn't give me any answers to the questions. Now, let's watch this. Follow along while I read. It says, last learning, Flingledope and Preben were in the nerd link, trepping gloopy capels and cleaning burly greps. Suddenly, a ditty struggle boofed into Flingledope's tresk. Preben glaped and glaped. Oh, Flingledope, he chafed. That duddy struggle is tunning in your grep. <laughs> All right? When did this story take place? Last Cerny. Last Cerny, right. Who was with Flingledope? Preben. Preben. Where were they? In the nerd lake. In the nerd lake. And they were trepping something. What were they trepping? Gloopy cables. Wait a minute. What, wait a minute. What kind of cables? Gloopy. Gloopy cables, right. And they're also cleaning something. What were they cleaning? Burly What kind of grabs? Burly really grabs, right. And then a struggle showed up. What kind of struggle was it? Did he? Did he struggle? Did they expect it? No. No, they didn't. Did they? And what did it do? Ooh. It boofed. Oh. <laughs> you can't get that stuff out either. Where did it, and where did it boof? In the floor of the what did Preben do? He was no help. What did he do? <laughs> and then he chiped something. What did he chife? <laughs> the first story you wanted to start every word, you couldn't answer a question. The second story, you don't have any idea what it's about. And you can respond to all the questions. You see, that's how complicated reading comprehension is. It's a very, very complicated task that we expect kids to learn on their own, and they cannot. They need direct instruction. Do we think that visual perception problems can affect behavior? Do you think so? Okay, let's try this on for size. You're a mom or a dad. Your, your son in the fourth grade comes home and says, Ma, they told me I can't uh, take the school bus again until I'm voting age, but I didn't do anything wrong. What do we automatically assume? Automatically. Of course you did something wrong. You must have done something wrong. You don't get thrown off a school bus for doing nothing wrong. You must have done something wrong. Let's take a look at that, because many times the learning disabled child, certainly not all the time, but many times the LD child will get into trouble and not know what he did wrong. And when he says, I don't know what I did wrong, he's being honest. And we're going to give that activity a shot right now. Here's what we're going to do. I brought in a picture today, and I'm going to show everybody this picture. And all I want everyone to do is to write a nice title for the picture. There's your picture. All right? Everyone, a good title for that picture, please. Something I'm going to like. No talking, just come up with a good title for the picture. Maria, do you like your answer? Yes. Carol, do you like yours? Stephanie, do you like yours? Is it good enough for me to read in front of the class? Yes. Okay. Stephanie gave me an answer that she says is not only good, but it's good enough for me to read in front of the class, okay? Were you trying to be funny here, Stephanie? No. Excuse me, class. Do you think this is funny? No. Did you write this to be funny? Would you like to see how funny I think this is, Stephanie? You know, I can think of nothing that a kid can write on a piece of paper that gives a teacher the right to tear it up in front of them. And yet it happens in schools all the time. And when I'm consulting at a school and they tell me there's a teacher who tears papers up in front of them, I say this to the teacher. I say to the teacher, suppose you passed in your contracts to your, to your uh, uh, grades, your grade report cards at the end of the year to your principal, your final reports. And you handed them to your principal, and the principal took them, and he looked at it, and he said, nah, this isn't what I had in mind, and he tore them up in front of you. I've never met a teacher that would tolerate that, yet we feel very comfortable doing it with kids. But let's get back to Stephanie, because Stephanie not only gave me an answer that was fresh, but then made it worse by telling me that it was good enough to read in front of the class. Well, you're not going to think it's very funny when you stay in for recess for a week, Stephanie, and when your mother comes in for a conference, and you know what she's going to say, class? You know what she's going to say? I got in trouble with Mr. Lavoy today, but I didn't do anything wrong. Because that's what she always says. You want to know what fresh answer Stephanie gave me and then embarrassed me by telling me it was good enough to read in front of the class? Death stalker. Death stalker. Here, I take the time. Now, take a look at it. I take the time to bring in a beautiful picture of a woman <laughs> looking at herself in the mirror. Take a look at it. Okay. <laughs> See it, Stephanie? You see it? 
the back of her head to see any reflection in the mirror. Okay. Many times, not all the time, but many times a learning disabled child will get in trouble and will literally not know what he or she did wrong. The coach will say, everybody get in the left hand side of the gym. Our kid stands on the right hand side of the gym and the coach says, that's it, you can't play. The child says, but I didn't do anything wrong. Because to his perception, he didn't see what happened is you responded to what you perceived. You misperceived the stimulus. Based on Stephanie's perception of this stimulus, that was a very good answer. But see, I wear the suit, I'm the teacher. And I determine what the stimulus is, and this is not a picture of a skull, there's no skull in this picture. It's not a matter of debate. This is not a skull, it's a picture of a woman looking at herself in a mirror. It's a classic picture called vanity. So I was expecting answers like uh, the big night out or getting ready for the prom or something like that. I certainly wasn't expecting something like death stock. <laughs> But again, what you did is you perceived, you reacted to the stimulus that you perceived, and then, if you could have seen the look on Stephanie's face, she was thinking, what is he so upset about? What did I do wrong? All I want you to do is to just write this letter. It's a hern, it's an uppercase hern, and I just want you to reproduce this letter for me. Okay, I will show you the letter, and you just reproduce the letter for me, okay? Here we go. That's what an uppercase hern looks like. Okay, everybody get a good look at it, okay? And please reproduce that where it says number two. All right, is everybody done? I want someone to come up and do one in front of the class. I'm certainly not going to pick the best turn. I'll pick the worst turn. So, uh, Carr, why don't you join us up here? <laughs> We're going to have Carr trace this picture, except she's just going to look in the mirror. She can't look down at the ground. She's going to look in the mirror. So what's going to begin happening is she's going to get mixed messages like children do with visual perception problems. Her eye is going to tell her to go right, but her hand will tell her to go left. And she should be able to reproduce this in about 15 seconds. But let's see how long it takes her and let's see how, how an effective a job she does because she now is going to have a visual motor integration problem where she is getting mixed messages from her eyes from a visual system and her hands from a toric system. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to trace this for me, if you will. And don't look at your paper in any way. Look in the mirror as you're tracing it. We'll count from 15, okay? Let's count backwards from 15. 15... 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Okay? <laughs> this is what we got. The mistake Carr made is she got off the line. Once you get off the line, it's almost impossible to get back. Let's have Jody come up and try this. Jody? You take this home, put it on the refrigerator car. <laughs> okay, let's give her 15 seconds again. Start, 15. Once you go off the line, it's almost impossible to get back. Look at the quality of that line. And then all those scratchings are her attempt to get back on the line again. Visual motor integration is a, very, is a major problem for many learning disabled children, and the writing process is this difficult for them. This really is not worst case scenario, it really is this difficult. Many learning disabled children will talk like this. You'll say to them, what did you do after school today, Bruce? <clears throat> well, I went, uh, we went to, uh, uh, with, um, uh, what's his name? He's big, and he used to, his father had to be, and he used to play, um, well, he always wears, uh, Mike. <laughs> and then we got, you know, we went in the big, it wasn't really like a, it wasn't like a bunny school, but I mean, it was big, but it was, it was, and it was kind of, well, you know, like a minivan. And we played, it was kind of, well, it wasn't really, it was kind of like baseball, no, because there were no bats, it couldn't be, and, it's, and you're thinking, oh, you think, why did I ask you this? You know, I don't need all this information, because many learning disabled children suffer from something called dysnomia. Dysnomia is a word-finding problem. It's that word in the tip of your tongue phenomenon that we all have four or five times a day, happens to the LD kid hundreds of times a day. 
In order to understand this, we have to understand a little bit about how the brain works. The human brain has two functions. One is storage and the other is retrieval. It's an amazing system. An absolutely amazing system. Right now, for instance, I have millions of pieces of information in my storage system. I know my wife's maiden name, I know my kids' birthdays, I know uh, my social security number, I know my home address, my phone number, my zip code, I know who does the CBS Evening News. And if Jody comes up to me and says, Rick, what's your zip code? My retrieval system runs into storage, takes out the card that says 06831, I give Jody my zip code, and then it goes back in the same place until I need it again. It's a wonderful system when it works. But what happens with learning disabled children is that there is a problem between storage and retrieval. They can't get the information out. And many times they will get it out, use it, and then put it back in the wrong place. So when they need it again, retrieval goes into storage and they can't find the word they're looking for. You see, everything that you do in your life is one of two kinds of activities. Everything you do in your life is either an associative task or a cognitive task. Now what is the difference between these two? You can only do one cognitive thing at a time, but you can do two or more associative things at a time. Because you can drive, which is associative, and talk, which is associative at the same time. So you're driving, Associative, you pick, up your kids in the, you pick up your kids at school, you've got your three children in the back seat, you're driving associative, talking associative, driving associative, talking associative. Suddenly the hailstones start to come, the road's getting slippery, your car's getting difficult to control, the car's in front of you beginning to swerve, and you turn and say, what to the kids? What? <laughs> Not shut up. <laughs> I got it. I'm a parent. I'm a father, I've got three children. I, you don't say shut up to your children. Of course not. You turn to the children and you say, children? <laughs> you say children driving, which had previously been an associative experience. <laughs> Isn't that what you mean? No, you say, shut up, I've got to drive here, okay? In other words, you can only do one cognitive thing at a time. For children with dysnomia, speaking is not an associative process, it's a cognitive process and they can only do that. Imagine the difficulty this presents for a child who's trying to take notes, who's trying to listen and write at the same time. With all the wonderful study skills programs that are out there, we have to buy into the fact that there are some children who will never be able to take notes because listening for them is a cognitive experience and they can't do two things at one time. So what you're gonna do now for the first time in a very long time, you're gonna get the opportunity to see what it's like to be dysnomic and to have speaking be a cognitive experience. Because here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna tell a round robin story around the room. I'm gonna give a sentence, I'm gonna call on other people to give sentences, they're gonna give sentences and I want nice long sentences and I want each sentence related to the sentence in front of it so it tells a good story all the way around the room. Let's begin with Kelly. I'll start, the boys went to the beach on a sunny day. Go ahead, Kelly. And they made sand castles and drank soda. Okay, about a novel, Kelly, just a sentence to be fine. Karen? Right, Karen? It started to rain and they went home. Okay, uh, now they're going home. Okay, Karen? When they got home, they were so bored they had to go out and get a video. Okay, Lee, now they've got a video. They sat in front of the TV and ate a snack. Okay, Maria? The video machine broke and it got stuck. Okay, come on. Come on. So then they took the machine back to the video store to get it fixed. And? And then um, they got there and the store was closed. Okay, this is getting exciting. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now that, now see, speaking, we just did that activity where speaking was an associative task for you. Was that difficult? Not particularly, no. But now let's make it cognitive. Now what I'm going to do is make you go through what, every, what learning disabled children with dysnomia go through. Now I'm going to make the English language a cognitive experience for you because now we're going to do the same thing except I'm going to add another rule. And that is that you can't use any words that contain the letter N. Not just begin with the letter N, but contain the letter N. 
What you're going to have to do, if you think this is worst case scenario, I'm making it worse than it really is, listen to the way you sound. You're going to sound just like learning disabled children because you're going through the same experience they go through. <coughs> because what I'm doing is I'm making it such that your retrieval system goes into storage but can't find the words you want, then will find words and realize you can't use them, will get stuck in phrases that you can't finish. You're going to go through what LD kids go through. Now, I want everyone nice and loud. Again, good sentences, long sentences. Don't start thinking of sentences now because they've got to be related to the sentence in front of it. No generic sentences, okay? Here we go. The boys went to the beach on a sunny day. Lee. They ate treats. They ate? Treats. They ate trees? Treats. 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 They ate treats. treats. Stephanie, now they're eating. Remember, two lessons here. Treats had Quickly, a lot Quickly. of sugar. The treats had a lot of sugar. <laughs> yeah. After they ate, they swam. <laughs> uh, Jane. Remember, two lessons uh, in this activity. Water was very warm. Okay, now quickly, let's go. Tom? Water. Quickly. Uh, here's, a, here's a teaching tip, by the way, for you teachers. If an LD child is having trouble thinking of a word, snap your fingers, tap your feet, <laughs> and remind them that everyone's waiting. That really helps. <laughs> Come on, Tom, let's go. Water fell from the sky. Water fell from the sky. And. <laughs> Remember, we have two lessons here. And. <coughs> nice and loud. Yes, the water fell from the sky. <laughs> Go ahead, Ann. The water became deeper. Okay, Rita. They went home. I'm sorry, Rita. They went home. Oh. Okay, class. Okay, remember I told you there were going to be two lessons? We just had our first one. I may believe I didn't hear the N in the word went. Raise your hand, please, if you turn Rita in. Raise your hands. Everybody, hands up, up. Maria, up, up. Let's take a look at this. You people have been learning disabled for one hour. You've already begun to develop one of the most unattractive traits that people complain about learning disabled kids. So many times parents and teachers will say to me, if he minded his own business as well as he minds everybody else's, he'd be fine. If anyone at home makes a mistake, he's the first one to call it to everyone's attention. Is that true for the LD kids you work with? You bet it is. Because if you take a bright person and you make it such that they can't learn, it becomes an obsession with them to convince themselves and everyone else that they're not the only ones that make mistakes. So there are two lessons here. One is, one is that you are very quick to turn each other in after one hour of a learning disability. But the second is, how difficult is it to talk this way? It's very difficult. Let's keep it going. Carol, now what, where did you have them? They went, they, well, let them go home, Carol. Now they're home. Go ahead. They were tired, so they went to... Oh. Sorry. Steve, Karen went after you again. <laughs> the tension for Karen after this game. Okay, the second point of this activity is how difficult is it to talk this way? It is very difficult. Can you imagine the anxiety of the learning disabled child? What could I have given you that would have made this easier? What could I have given you? Time. time. What if I gave you time? What if I said, I want a group of you to sit here for a half hour, take a piece of paper, and write a story about boys at the beach, but you can't use any ends? Could you have done that? Yes. Yeah. You could have done that. Sometimes the greatest gift we can give the LD child is a gift of time, both as parents and as teachers. As teachers, we do this. Lee is my LD child in the class, and we say, I want everyone to think of the causes for the Civil War. Everyone think of the five causes for the Civil War. While you're thinking of that, I'm going to erase the blackboard. So I erase the blackboard. What I'm doing is I'm giving Lee four or five seconds to come up with some answers. And then I turn and I say, okay, five cogs with the Civil War. Lee, please give us one. And Lee says, the difference between urban and agrarian society. Terrific. <laughs> <laughs> Not bad. So Lee gives me her answer. I've given Lee some time to process. And secondly, I called on her first. Because, you see, she's only probably come up with one or two answers, where everybody else has come up with all five. So I call on Lee first. As I said, sometimes the greatest gift you can give children is a gift of time.
Before we begin this activity, I'm going to humor your learning disability for you. First of all, I understand that some of you have difficulty with reversals. You can, because you're learning disabled, you have some difficulty with reversals, which is a small part of learning disabilities, but it certainly is a part. And that you don't understand the difference between P, D, B, and Q. So let me teach you those. It's very, very simple. D is a balloon with a stick on it. That's easy to remember, okay? Now this is something completely different. This is your P, this is your P here. This is a P, this is a stick with a balloon next to it. And this is your D, this is a stick with a balloon next to it. So now you know the difference between these four. And you can tell the difference. Can you? No. Many learning disabled children will make mistakes and confuse these four letters. Why? We all do. We were taught that this is a what? This is easy stuff, guys. This is a what? <laughs> This is a watch. What is it now? A watch. A watch. How about now? Watch. How about now? Watch. A watch. In other words, we learn from the time we're born until we're five years old that spatial orientation does not dictate object identification. In other words, this is a watch no matter how I hold it. It's not a watch and now it's a can of motor oil and now it's an AMS and radio. <laughs> it doesn't change because I've moved it. It continues to be a watch. Suddenly, you go to school in the first grade some lady in a skirt says, forget everything that you know about perception. Because now, if you take this shape and you hold it this way, it's a P and it says pa. If you turn it this way, it's a B and it says ba. If you turn it this way, it's a D and it says da. If you turn it this way, it says Q and God knows what it says. Okay? <laughs> You'll get that in the second grade, you don't have to worry about that. Right now. In other words, for the first time in our lives, spatial orientation, the way I hold this in space, changes what it actually is. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to read another story. Except now, when you see the letter P, it might be a P, but it also might be a B or a Q. And when you see the words broken, they're not necessarily going to be broken where they should be. And they're not going to be written on that nice, neat, invisible line. And you're going to find what it's like to try to read as a learning disabled or a dyslexic child. So let's begin, please, with Maria. Come on, said Betsy. We have to... Remember, it could be any one of three letters. <laughs> oh. Four letters. B, 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 or Q. We have to... Come on, Maria. We have to pick up some... No, not some. We have to pick up what, Carol? This... Corn. We don't have en another. Can Come on, quickly, Carol. Another can of. Can of what? Come on, Carol. <laughs> don't help, please. Can of what? Come on, Carol. It's a simple word. Another can of what? Come on, Carol. Hurry, please. Something corn. Well, uh, yeah, the, the word, is the word something, Carol? What is it? Three letters, Carol. How tough can this be? Dog. Dog. No. <laughs> Come on, Carol. Quickly, please. I'm sweating. Um. Carol, this is an easy word. How many times as teachers do we tell a child you can't do something that the task is easy? Think about that. The child can't do it. He doesn't need to hear that it's easy. Come on, Carol. There were three letters in the word, Carol. How difficult can this be? <laughs> Very difficult. I don't know. Another can of what, Jody? Popcorn. Popcorn. <laughs> Go ahead, Jody. Oh. Oh, so you sit back on your laurels. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Are Jody. Are we going earth to eat popcorn that that's that's what? Come on, let's go, Joey. Bin bin on the floor. Asked Susan. Okay, Lee, be a little careful here, Lee. We <laughs> can wash it. That's the answer. That's a good idea, said Susan. We can wash it. Nancy. The children went to work. It took the, them all night 
No. <laughs> Just read it on the page, Ian Anson, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Look around, by the way. Look at the number of class clowns that we've developed here. Huh? <laughs> Isn't that a typical reaction of learning to say oh, I got children? it. I got it. It ahead, took them Nancy. a long time oh. to pick up all the, where am I? Oh, yes. The popcorn. Karen. I'm not too good at this. The. Then they took the corn to the kitchen. And Betsy was. No, it's not what it says. Oh, uh, well, Betsy. And Betsy. Come on, Karen. The kitchen and Betsy. Go ahead, Debbie. Washed it. Washed it. Uh. Is your name Debbie? <laughs> Is your name Debbie? Is your name Debbie? Is your name Debbie? Not Debbie? Now, am I using that rhetorical question with Karen? Absolutely shut down communication. That's no way to communicate. There's no correct answer to that question. And it's extremely intimidating. In other words, we only use rhetorical questions with adults when we're trying to hurt their feelings, but we use them with kids all the time. You know what I've always thought? If you want to break a teacher of using rhetorical questions, assign them a child who answers rhetorical questions. How many times am I supposed to tell you to keep your hands to yourself? Kid says, 14. 14. <laughs> what am I supposed to do with you? How about a weekend at Disney World? Be nice. If they answered rhetorical questions, we, we wouldn't use them as often. But it's a weapon we use with, against kids all the time. And I'm not sure that we should. Debbie. All the children thought that that on, was just the thing to do. Karen. That's Betsy. Put the corn in to in two big um, pans to put in the oven. Okay, wasn't that fun? How are you feeling right now? Okay, and again, again, let me throw some questions at you. Whose idea was it to put the corn in the oven? Who knows? Why couldn't they use the potter? Whose idea was it to sweep it up off the floor? See, nobody really knows. Even though you read that material, you went through that material, you don't have any idea what the content was. Because all of your energy went into the decoding of the material. And yet I see many teachers who get ecstatic because they've got a child who's in the fourth grade, who's reading in the fourth grade, and they push him through a sixth grade textbook. But if the child might be decoding it, but not actually reading it and understanding it. And therefore, we're not doing the child any favor and putting through that experience. This activity is dedicated to that kid, and I've seen him thousands of times, that will go up to a teacher and say, excuse me, teacher, I don't know how to do this worksheet. The teacher says the directions are right there, read them. Yeah, I read them, but I don't know how to do it. The directions are right there, read them. I read it, but I don't know how to do it. They're right there, I read it, but I don't know how to do it. And the teacher finally says, it says circle the right answer. And the kid says, okay, no problem. <laughs> In other words, once I heard it, I'm fine, but I've got to hear it first. I've got to hear it before it makes any sense to me. But now you're going to get a chance to see what it's like to be an auditory learner. Because here's what I want you to do. When I say go, I want you to turn to the last page in the booklet. You already know this story, so you don't have to read the whole thing, I'm sure. <laughs> All right, everybody look up here. Did you like those stories? Uh, sure. And Rhea, what month did you think of when you read this story? <laughs> no idea. What month, Rita? Give me a month. March. Not March, no. Why would you think of March? What about you, Tom? What month? December. Why would you think of December? Ann, what month? Take a guess, Ann. Take a guess. June. Not June. Are you guessing, Ann? For crown, it's not June. Karen. March. Debbie. January. Car. February. February. <laughs> Car, stand up and tell them why. <laughs> the only one left. Okay. Now I'm going to read you this story, and you're going to get it through your ears for the first time, through your favorite modality, and you'll be able to understand it. Here we go. Story number one. Once upon a time, when the father of our country was a little boy, he was walking on his papa's farm with a widow hatchet. What's the story about? George Washington. We'll start again. Dennis Popper came as trolling by. 
Jesus Christ, said he. <laughs> How's been chopping down my cherry tree? Don't bust the guts of his son, Gorge. I cannot tell a lie. I did it, but we're with a ratchet. Then his father lost his temper and tuck a swish and pat a little judge on his canvas off. And the mural of the story is, don't I chop down cherry trees? Again, we could have sat here and I could have had you read that story over and over and over, and until I gave you some auditory input, it wouldn't have made any sense. That's why it is important that some kids have their books put on tape, so that they can get the information through their ears. They can understand it that way. They can't understand it when they get it through their eyes. We're not going to be able to be effective as parents and teachers with the elderly child unless we understand the critical value of fairness. And before we talk about it, we have to take a little bit of a backtrack, talk about the work of a gentleman named Lawrence Kohlberg. Lawrence Kohlberg was a Harvard educator and scientist, and he taught us pretty much everything we know about moral development in children. He taught us basically two things. One is that kids learn their moral according to what they see us do, not according to what we tell them to do. My 12-year-old son, Kit, suppose I wanted to teach him the value of honesty. So I sit down with Kit on Monday night and I tell him about Abraham Lincoln. And how Lincoln took a book by mistake and carried it to the woods of Kentucky 12 miles back to its rightful owner. Tuesday night I tell him about George Washington. George Washington chopped down the cherry tree and said, I cannot tell a lie. Wednesday night I read to him from the Bible about honesty. Thursday night I read to him from the Koran about honesty. Friday night, we do an hour and a half of honesty role playing. Five and a half hours of intensive honesty curriculum, as only, as only an elementary school teacher can do it, right? We have film strips, we take a field trip to the Honesty Museum, <laughs> to the basement of the Watergate Building in Washington. <laughs> Five and a half hours of intensive honesty curriculum, and then on Saturday night, I take Christian to the movies. Kit and I get up to the booth to buy the tickets, and I bend over and whisper into his 12 year old ear. Tell a man you're 10. <laughs> Tell him you're 10. Understand, Kit learned more about honesty in that five second exchange at the theater than he did in five and a half hours of lecture. Because kids learn their morals according to what they see, not according to what we tell them to do. And the second thing Kohlberg taught us is that morals do indeed develop. We've got to keep that in mind as we talk about the critical moral value of fairness. Because as I speak to parents and teachers all over this country, I see classrooms and families being run based on the adult's concept of honesty, the adult's concept of truth, the adult's concept of liberty, patriotism, religion, and yet those same families and classrooms are being run based on the child's concept of fairness. What I'd like you to do when the session is over tonight is go home, go up into your attic, pull down your old philosophy books from high school or college, or even take out a Webster's Dictionary and look up the definition of fairness. Fairness does not mean that everyone gets the same Fairness actually means that everyone gets what he or she needs. And yet still, I'll deal with teachers What I'll say to a teacher, Jody's going to be in your class next semester, teacher. She's a wonderful kid, very bright kid. She's going to do very well in your math class. But she's got a learning disability, and it's called a five-point copying problem, and she can't copy off the blackboard. So here's what I'd like you to do. When you put problems on the blackboard for everyone to copy, I'd like you to write up an extra set for Jody and give that to Joey. And if that doesn't work, you don't have time for that, at least pretty quick, maybe Lee could write up two sets and then hand one across to Jody, or even put a piece of carbon paper on the Lee sheet so when she writes up one set of problems as an extra one automatically to give to Jody, I'd like you to do that, please. Invariably, the teacher will say, I can't do that. And I say, why not? There's a lot of answers I'll accept. I'll accept because I don't know how. I'll accept because I don't have time. I'll accept because I don't believe in mainstreaming. I'll accept because I don't like Joey. I will go to the mat with a teacher and I will discuss any one of those answers with a teacher. The one answer I will not discuss, the one answer that I think is beneath contempt and beneath discussing, is the answer I hear most often. And that is, I can't do that for Joey. Why? It's not, fair. it's not fair to the others. It's got nothing to do with the others. Joey needs it, the others don't. It has nothing to do with the others. Let's take it and try it in an adult situation. Suppose I'm up here lecturing. In the middle of my lecture, God forbid, in the middle of my lecture, Carolyn here falls off her chair. I look down at her, she's turning blue, cardiac arrest. God forbid she's having a heart attack right in front of us. And I'm trained in CPR techniques, so I know what to do. 
How ludicrous, how unfair, how absolutely foolish and unethical would it be for me to say, hey, Carolyn, I'd like to help you. I really would. But heck, we've got 30 people here. I haven't got time to give CPI to everybody. And it wouldn't be fair to only give it to you. But the teacher who says, I can't help the LD child because it's not fair to the others, is working at the same moral level as a 10-year-old child. And this is particularly important for you as parents to understand. Because I know a lot of parents of special needs kids who spend full time beating themselves up and trying to keep the scales balanced. What do I do? Johnny, the LD child, needs a special tutor. How do I make that up to the other kids so that I'm fair to everybody? You don't have to. As long as you can look in the eyes of the siblings and say, honey, if it was you, I'd be doing the same thing. Fairness does not mean that everyone gets the same. Fairness means that everyone gets what he or she needs. And we're not going to be able to work successfully with the child, mainstream child, learning disabled child, the mainstream classroom, until teachers and parents begin to understand that in order to be fair, we've got to treat them differently. Don't want to do. Listen to the comments of some of the survivors of this Fat City workshop that we videotape. I mean, I really had a headache, like right here. And I said, I don't want all these people to think that I'm stupid. You know, and then I said, God, imagine kids with learning disabilities who must sit in class all the time saying, all of these people think I'm really stupid. And I mean, I know I'm not stupid. As anxiety producing as it was, I can deal with it here because I know the situation. I know that everybody around me is making mistakes. But if something like this had happened to me when, you know, I was, I was a child and I was very sensitive, I would have been devastated. These kids are going through such a crisis like, oh my God, if my friends think I'm stupid, I'm ruined. And basically at that age, they are. Because, you know, their kids are like, oh, this person's stupid, he doesn't know anything, and I don't want him to play with me this recess, or... And that's devastating to a kid at that age. I think it would be a good experience for a lot of other children in classrooms at some point to understand what their friends and their classmates are going through. Um, maybe if they had to read a backwards passage or couldn't see the cow, um, it might help them to better understand why Johnny has to go see you know, the, the specialist for a few hours or why he gets that extra attention, that same thing about fairness. It's really important to have the sister or the brother of the LD child to understand that he's not stupid, he's not um, backwards, it's just that he has to learn in a different way. I think it really expresses how it is for me in a classroom and it shows everyone else how it is because I know a lot of my friends, like, I'll sit in the class and I'll be reading it, something and they'll just start making fun of me because it takes me either a long time to figure out what the words are or I read them backwards and it doesn't make sense to them, but it really doesn't make sense to me either. This has mostly dealt with in uh, what the classroom is like, but if you think about it, like if you just go out in the, in the, real, in the world and you go and look around, you, and I just think how frustrated, frust frustrating it would be if you go out and you like you look at something like you're walking down the street you see something you want to read and you can't understand it the problem that I see that my child has had and I think most learning disability kids suffer from is a poor self-esteem which can be so offset by the teachers in the school if they are enlightened about what they're doing so that to me is the exciting you know potential that this program would offer because they suffer so in terms of how they perceive themselves. It's so frustrating for the teacher who doesn't understand what's going on. You know, teachers, um, you know, when they say, look at me when you're talking to me, you know, and, and they throw their catchphrases out. These catchphrases, they don't understand what's happening to the child. They're not doing it to be malicious. They need the information. We work with thousands of parents each year through our association. And the thing that I hear the most is um, their frustration, anxiety, intention in dealing with not only the child but the school system. Um, the, the professionals um, in their lives don't really understand the emotional baggage that the parent brings to every meeting and every conference um, you know, through living with this child. And when I think of the torture I put my first learning disabled ch child through with, when she was learning to read of saying so like on and on, ka-ata, ka-ata, thinking that eventually this would become cat, and it never became cat, and I would be so frustrated with it. We accentuate the positive in our house. Um, 
We don't dwell on that which you cannot do. We dwell on that which you can do and encourage them to do it even better. Oh, Earth to Carol, come in, please. Well, Nancy's better than I am. <laughs> I can't think. Did you write this to be funny? You're picking Come on, Nancy, quickly. Everybody's waiting. I can't read it. The. The. That's it. Was. That's all I, that's what? All I can do. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> I got it. Hold on. <laughs> there were three letters in the word, Carol. How difficult can this be? Very difficult. 